The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, and um, welcome to my very last Q&A voiceover webinar of 2014. My name is Bill DeWeese, and I want to thank you. A big special thank you for being here tonight. I've got to be honest, being the night before uh, Christmas Eve, I didn't expect as many people to register and show up as have, so... Um, I know that voiceover is important to you. It's important to me. And I thought it would be good if we spent a last hour together uh, talking about the industry, talking about your business, about your career, answering the questions and, and sharing information that you'll find helpful. Um, and by the way, just I just want to make sure I do believe everything is working properly. But if in the question section there uh, of your panel, if you could type in uh, just, hey, I'm here or hey, I can hear you. Everything is, is, is good. That would be very that would be helpful just to verify that we're okay. And by the way, um, yes, if you look at the panel there on your screen, yeah, and okay, great, coming through loud. And thank you very much, everybody. Wow, everybody responded at once. That's awesome. Uh, it warms my heart. <laughs> as you can see there on the panel, there is a, a place to to put in your questions. So, as you have questions or or things that you would like to talk about tonight, things that you would like me to address, feel free to enter those in. I will certainly get certainly get to as many as I can tonight. Um, though I know some of you have come on to the call specifically because I offered a coupon code for a brand new program. So please, and I, and don't misunderstand, this is not a one hour commercial, but allow me 30 seconds to 60 seconds to share with you what I'm talking about in that coupon code, because I know some of you probably would like to get off the call so you can finish doing your Christmas or holiday preparations. So in order to respect your time, let me share that information with you. Then we'll jump into Q&A and then I can go back and address that again later in case uh, you didn't catch, you know, if, if, in case you didn't catch all of the information. I recently uh, did a four-week seminar, a webinar series that I recorded with Christina Malizia. She's uh, a world-class voice character actor in Los Angeles. She's actually the voice of three different voices on the world's uh, most popular video game, which is League of Legends. And she's worked for Mattel and Nickelodeon and Disney and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is four hours of material addressing all things character voice, uh, about the industry, the opportunities, where to get work, how to get work, the skills that are needed. Um, the program is available at VOCharactersuccess.com. And I'm going to share my screen with you, and I'm going to give you the coupon code, and then I'm going to jump right into the, the Q&A. Again, for those of you who have to get going, in order to respect your time, I want to give this to you right now. Uh, let me see. Let me do this right now. Give me just a moment, and hopefully you'll be able to see my screen. And I'm going to type this on the screen. And maybe if you could just verify to let me know that you can see it, I would appreciate it. VOCharactersuccess.com. That is the website. Um, the program, like I said, it's, it's four hours of uh, material, a uh, video, and what I'm going to do, let's see here, the sale price of this is $197, but tonight, or for the, actually through Christmas night, so for the next 48, 48 hours plus a few, until Christmas night, midnight central time, you can get $50 off by using the coupon code 50 off. 50OFF. And again, that's uh, good for the next 48 hours, a few hours more through midnight Christmas night at VOCharactersuccess.com. Okay. Now let's move on to Q&A. Um, I, I, uh, I wanted to address something or actually repeat something that I mentioned in an email the other day to get us started. And perhaps you saw it, maybe you didn't, but I think even if you have it bears repeating because it really gets to the heart of what's happening right now in the industry. Somebody asked me a question the other day, and it's really what prompted me uh, to do this one last final Q&A webinar uh, before, before this year ended. And the question was this, are you as excited about the future of voiceover now as you were when you first started? And I've been doing this for almost nine years now on a full-time basis. And my answer is an absolute yes. I am more excited about voiceover and the voiceover industry now than I was when I first started in regards to what I see the future, where I see the future of this industry. And there are four reasons for that. Let me, let me briefly touch on these because, again, these are areas that you should be thinking about taking advantage of as you look to grow your career in 2015. And number one, uh, right at the top of the list, is the audiobook industry. You've probably heard me talk about it before. But the audio, audiobook industry has been in high growth mode for several years and will remain in high growth mode 
uh, for the foreseeable future. And the reason behind that is because uh, the biggest reason is because Amazon is really driving the industry. They are they've made a big push to get as many audiobooks to market as they can. Uh, there are something like 100,000, give or take, uh, books that are published every year, of which only about 5% are actually turned into audiobooks. And Amazon has had the goal of, of getting as many of those 100,000 a year turned into audiobooks as possible. Obviously, uh, they have a financial motive for doing that. Uh, but they also they own Audible.com, which is their online uh, seller of audiobooks. And now they've created ACX, the three letters. And let me put this up on the screen here so you can see that. Hold on just a second here. ACX.com. And ACX.com is, uh, again, a website created by Amazon uh, to put narrators, voiceover talent like you and I, in contact with publishers and authors. Uh, I know in Canada, uh, Canada is not set up. They're not set up for Can Canadians to be able to take advantage of ACX, but they are working on that. They are working on that. So hopefully here very soon, um, again, for my Canadian friends, you will have access to, uh, to ACX and be able to uh, take advantage because it is the fastest, it is the easiest way by far uh, to get voice or to get, to, to get audiobook work. Uh, the second issue uh, deals with um, explainer videos. An, expl an explainer video is a very popular niche within the voiceover industry. Uh, explainer videos uh, essentially are these long form commercials, two, two to three minutes long, give or take, that you will find on almost any business's website these days. And they often start with, they're like whiteboard illustrations or little cartoons with narrations. Meet Jack. Jack has a problem. Jack's car won't start, so Jack called Bob's Automotive. Um, they don't all start with Meet Jack or Jill or whoever, but that's the format that you often see and hear, these explainer videos. The reason they're so popular is because video is so cheap now to create. Yeah, a decade ago, what may have cost you ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, you can now do for pennies on the dollar. It's cheap to produce high quality video, and so there's a big demand for voices. So that is an area to be to be aware of. Also, the continued growth of the learning and training industry. That's something I know quite a bit about because that's the industry I came out of when I became involved in voiceovers. And at that time, um, training training was just beginning to go online. And it was very expensive for companies to create learning management systems, these big, you know, the, the, uh, the hardware and software infrastructure to support training uh, for, for the organization. And so typically only the larger, the Fortune 500, 1,000 companies were doing this. Well, again, as media has become cheaper and the content has become cheaper to create, this learning and training is exploding and it's becoming more and more accessible for smaller companies. And so what that means to you and me is that more and more narration for training and learning programs is becoming available. So that's something else to keep in mind. And then finally, and I just touched on that, and that is uh, the character voiceovers. The video game industry is uh, is exploding. And uh, I learned a lot during the four weeks with Christina Malizia, the four-week webinar series, learned a lot. And uh, what I found out was is that, and I, and I play some video games. I mean, you know, I, I have for, for many, many years, but I'm not a gamer per se. I mean, I'm not immersed in the, in the industry, but the types of games that have evolved and now the, the role-playing games and the multiplayer role-playing games and the online games and the character development and the many, many voices and, uh, that are required for these, not to mention digital toys and... Um, that is a fast growth niche within voiceover. It used to be it was a very narrow niche, and if you wanted to participate, you pretty much had to live in Los Angeles. And now the rules of the game are changing, and it's become more open and available uh, to, to the rest of us, uh, whether we live in Los Angeles or not. And again, that's why I'm, I'm so excited about VOCharacterSuccess.com. But those are four uh, areas within the voiceover industry to keep your eyes on as we go into 2000. 15. So, with that as a start, let's uh, let me let me jump right into into uh, questions and answer as many of these uh, for you as I possibly can. Okay, let's see here. Demo copy for commercial demo. The question is, do I have any thoughts on using a script of a national spot which is voiced by a celebrity, probably not recognizable by most people. Okay. So, should you use a script 
on your demo that's voiced by a recognizable celebrity? Well, first of all, let me let me address the component of doing a national spot. I believe in voicing commercials um, that have recognizable national brands because it stages you properly. It's not you're just not trying to fool anybody. People within our industry, agencies and casting directors know that wasn't necessarily your commercial, but they want to know what you sound like staged doing a national commercial. So that's a good thing. Now, one thing I do stay away from, if it's a extremely highly recognizable spot with a highly recognizable celebrity, like for instance, let's say a, a Jim Krasinski spot, Esurance. Um uh, you know, everybody knows his voice from from The Office. And is that is that his actor name or his real name? It, it doesn't matter. It's it's he's highly recognizable. Everybody would know that, and they would be comparing you to him. Not a fair comparison. Uh, not that he's better or worse, or you're better or worse. But it's just that everybody knows him and can identify his voice. So if they hear you, it just doesn't seem right because they're used to hearing him. So if it's highly recognizable, if it's a highly recognizable identif- identifiable voice, I would stay away from it. Next question. How do I learn how to add compression to my recordings? Sounds okay to me right now, but how do I play around with that? Okay. Um, I don't want to get, if you know me very well at all, uh, you know that my philosophy when it comes to the technical side of voiceovers is that less is more. Um, I guess my first question would be, um, what, how do you want to use the compression? What do you want to use it for? Is this to use uh, just for specific projects? Do you plan to use it all the time? Um, what compression does, essentially, in a nutshell, is squeeze the sound wave to make it thicker, fatter is the best way I can put it. It sounds fuller. It sounds punchier. And um, compression is typically used... Uh, when projects are mastered, when they're finished, there's usually a touch of compression at it to give it a bigger, bolder, and more even level uh, as well, although there are other ways to achieve that end as well. I'll just leave it at this. Um, there's different kinds of compression, and you know we don't have time to go into a, a, a class on the different types and how to use it, but I will say this. When it comes to what I do on a day-to-day basis and probably what you to do on a day-to-day basis, which is dry voice, we're auditioning and we're doing projects for clients with dry, just our voice and nothing else. It's okay, sometimes preferable not to use any compression. There are, there are some clients who don't want you to affect the voice at all. They want it raw just as you record it so that they can do what they want on their side of things. But if you do choose to use compression, Use a very light touch, like a two to two to one, three to one compression. Less is more. Don't try just because it sounds. It may sound good to you to be big and punchy and bold. Doesn't mean the client wants it that way. And if you're a radio person, you know what I'm saying. As radio people, and I come from that background, we we would love to hear our voice on the air, big and bold and powerful and punchy. But that's not the way to record voiceovers. So again, less is more. Uh, next question. How do I usually pronounce the word D-A-T-A? I come across it all the time with narration. <laughs> That's a good question. I actually had this conversation with somebody uh, just the other day. Um, data. The commonly accepted way of pronouncing D-A-T-A is data. Now, that doesn't mean everybody pronounces it that way. Data is often used. And I'm not saying that data is wrong, but I will tell you this. I do a lot of recording for tech companies. Microsoft, Dell, Hitachi, Motorola, VMware, etc. I do a lot, a lot, a lot of technical narration, and it's always data as opposed to data. So uh, if you err, I would err on the side of data or or data rather. And if they don't like it and they say, well, you know, or we want data instead of data, then you can always change it. But data, date, uh, that's what I always go with. Next question, Kim in Buffalo. When responding to -to pay-to-pay sites like Voices.com and the suggested bids are actually higher than your usual rate, how should you bid? High end, low, middle, thanks, and happy holidays. And happy holidays to you as well, Kim. That's a very good question because it does happen, right? Let's say um, you come across uh, uh, maybe it's a a let's say a project. It's a couple minutes long. Perhaps your typical rate, or you typically ask for three hundred dollars, and they're paying five hundred dollars. That's what the offer is. Then, by all means, all by all means, Kim, you take the five hundred dollars. And if you get hired for the job, what does that tell you? 
Well, that tells you that you're a $500 voice for that kind of work. You actually have more value than, than, than you realize. And believe me, I've been through this a hundred times. And what happens with each job that you book that is willing to pay you more than what you typically ask, you begin to, it begins to boost your confidence. And, and at that point, you know that people are willing to pay you more for your voice. Not because necessarily... It has to do with the person recording it, not, you know, not that there's a general value. I'm not saying that all, you know, X project should always be $200. But what I'm saying is a, a, a client may be willing to pay you $500, you know, $1,000 because they believe you are good enough and they want your voice enough to pay you that for the job. So if that's the value that the client has, then by all means, you should take, take that. Somebody just said, is anyone speaking yet? Yes, I am. Um... I hope, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay, since, next question. Since ACX is blocked off from us Canadians right now, what are the alternative ways to get work in this industry? Okay, Peter, good question. Uh, when I first started off recording audiobooks uh, several years back, there was no ACX. So I really, my audiobook um, success came prior. I'm pre-ACX, and I've booked plenty of work through ACX, but it'll, I did most I believe most of my work before ACX ever existed. And I built my, my audio, the audiobook part of my career the same way I did my commercial and narration and promo and imaging part of my career. And I did it the old-fashioned way. And that was, uh, I asked myself the question, who do I need to get to listen to my demos for the opportunity to work? Well, publishers, audiobook publishers specifically. So I spent a lot of time Googling and finding audiobook publishers. And then I spent a lot of time phone calling and emailing those publishers, asking, of, asking them if they were accepting demos from voice talent. Um, and that may sound super simplistic, but believe me, uh, if you know me well enough, Peter, you know that I, I approach everything as simplistically as possible. Uh, when it comes to business, I am a very simple guy. I don't think it's very complicated. And so I, I simply made enough calls and uh, sent enough emails until enough people listened to my demos that I, be, I began booking work. And then from that came, uh, came repeated work. So uh, I hope that's helpful, but it is possible. Uh, it's very, not only possible, but probable if you do the right things for you to build a, a voiceover book, uh, or I'm sorry, an audiobook career outside of ACX. Okay, so my next question is, uh, let me kind of expand. I'm just making an adjustment here so I can better see the questions. Okay, can you spend a couple of minutes talking about editing software, specifically editing software that removes noises, clicks, pops, etc.? Is Audacity the best? Well, uh, let, let me say this, Jonathan. I'm very apprehensive to say what's the best. Um, most good recording programs, and when I say good, Pro Tools, Adobe Audition, which is the program I use, uh, Sony SoundForge, uh, Audacity, and, and there's, a, there's a, you know, a longer list than that, um, they will all accomplish what you need to accomplish. Uh, I personally, again, this is a personal preference, and I'm not paid to say this, I prefer Adobe Audition. Um, I came from a broadcast background where I already knew Adobe Audition, which was helpful, but Adobe Audition... Um, is, is really created around people like us who record voiceovers. It's not, record, it's not created so much for the audio or the musician, the recording musician, although it certainly can do that. It's really created with a lot of the features that allow us to do, to remove the noises and clicks and pops, etc. cetera. I, I will tell you this, that being said, I do very little, I use very little in the way of software to do my audio correction. When I say audio correction, I mean noise, clicks, pops. Uh, I do it all manually, believe it or not. And one thing Adobe Audition allows me to do, and whether Audacity allows you to do this or any other program, I, I don't know. I imagine that they would. But I can use the scroll wheel on my mouse to zoom in on the waveform in front of me and, and to get really uh, surgically precise with my editing. So now when I'm editing, when I'm looking through there, I, if I see, I can visually see. I don't have to hear it. I can see it. I know where the pops and the clicks are. And I can very easily select it and quickly delete out the pop or the click. Um, is it tedious? Yeah, but you know what? I'm very, I've done it so long now, I'm very fast at it. So practice will help you with that. Um, so 
anyhow, again, and I've I've not worked extensively with anything outside of Adobe Audition. I've used Pro Tools some. Um, I've used Sony SoundForge some. I've I've messed around with uh, Audacity some. Uh, Logic Pro. I actually use Logic Pro for recording music, but I prefer Adobe Audition, and it allows me to get surgically, you know, into and manipulate the, the waveform the way I need to. Uh, next question is this: With pay-to-play sites, should you only audition using a portion of the script? It seems like, especially in Voice One Two Three, that the client wants the entire script read. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it varies. I know from audition to audition whether they want the whole thing read or not. I will tell you this, I don't get overly concerned with that. I mean, if people are going to steal your voice, they're going to steal a voice. And so I figure, you know, I let them worry about that. I don't worry about that. My concern is this. I want to give myself the best chance to get the job. So I will typically read whatever script is provided because, and let me explain why. Oftentimes, a voiceover talent is chosen after the, your audition is put to the video that they're trying to put it, to match it up with, so let's say it's an explainer video, it's a two-minute explainer video, or well, let's make it let's make it easier. Let's say it's a 60-second commercial, and uh, the client wants to hear your voice put up to the video, and so I don't want to do anything that detracts from my voice. But if doing something like leaving out something or saying that changing the name of the business, because that's going to get into the head of the client because they, they need to be able to, to hear me, what it's like for me to do their project. So typically I don't change things. Now, others would disagree and others would. I think even one, I think maybe it's even voices.com. Um, I've seen where they actually on the website suggest that you make a minor edit to the commercial so they can't use it. Um, again, my approach has been, I just don't, I don't worry about it. I don't. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities, and if somebody was going to steal a voice, they're going to steal a voice. And, you know, whether it's yours or mine or somebody else's, you know, they're going to do it. So uh, I want to give myself the best possible chance to get a job, and I do get jobs. I get lots of jobs, so it hasn't hurt me. So my suggestion is is to err on the side of, of you know, taking a chance. And if somebody steals it again, you know, what are you going to do? They're going to do it anyhow, to, if not to you, to somebody else, and you can't help that. Next question is, how do I find a talent agent? This is a, we'll put this in the column of FAQ. This is a frequently asked question. Agents are good. Let me, you know, and I won't go into a long explanation, but let me, just to help you kind of put this in perspective, um, don't depend on an agent for your success. It's, if you do, chances are you will not succeed. Agents are good, but look at them as a part of a marketing plan, not a complete plan. Okay, that being said, how do you find an agent? I tell you what, I, I would start in my own market. Wherever you're at, let's say you're in Indianapolis, I would do a search for Indianapolis area talent agents. Uh, reason being because most agents want to work with talent in their region. They're working with regional uh, unless it's a national agency, and that would be a little bit different. But most, there are a lot of agencies that are very regional, and um, they like to work with talent who have the ability to come into a studio if needed to work. So that's where I would start. And uh, you simply, you know, you can look them up online. And uh, if you go to their website, oftentimes they will tell you the process for submitting your demo. If not, you call up. Hi, I'm Bill DeWeese. I would, I'm just calling to find out if you're currently accepting voiceover demos. How would you like to receive that? CD. Some actually still want a CD. Some want you to send an MP3. Now let's 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 expand it outside of regional. Uh, perhaps you want to, to want to go out into another region. For instance, maybe you have Source Connect or ISDN. I have ISDN. Therefore, I have a number of agents in other cities and other markets who work with me because I can easily patch into a local studio in their market to do the job. Um, and if I'm working, you know, if you're working with a national agent. Uh, then by all means, they will almost certainly want you to have either ISDN and or Source Connect, uh, which is a software program that allows you to connect remotely with, with another studio. So it's, uh, I, again, it's, the answer is fairly simplistic, and that is, um, you know, you can use Google uh, to search and find talent agents. And believe me, that's how I've done it throughout my career. And, um, and also, and you might find this hard to believe, I've, I've found at least one agent through Craigslist, one of my better agents. Yes, through Craigslist. And, um, and so I'll contact them and I'll simply ask, are you, are you accepting voiceover demos at this time? And uh, if you do that enough times, I guarantee you somebody's going to say, sure, send me your demo. Okay, next question is this. 
The rules here in Montreal for the gaming industry require VOs to be union. If I join AFTRA to pursue that niche, I exclude myself from doing a lot of non-union work as, as decreed by the rules. How would you reconcile this quandary? First of all, um, I want you to understand I am not, a, I'm not an expert on, on SAG-AFTRA and all things union. There are people who are better qualified to address union issues because I am a non-union talent. Uh, the reason I am a non-union talent is not because I'm anti-union. It's because I prefer to be in complete control of what I do with my career. I want to be able to work for who I want to, when I want to. I, I'm okay with collecting my own money. As a matter of fact, I, I almost prefer it, and I don't have any problem uh, doing that. I want to be able to negotiate my rates. If it's a small client that can only pay X number of dollars, I want to be able to do that. If it's a bigger client and they can pay 100 times that, then I want to be able to do that too. I, I don't want the restrictions. So again, I just to kind of clarify. So now, in, in your situation, um, it might it might be, and again, I first of all, research to make sure you understand because maybe becoming union doesn't disqualify you from a lot of the things that you think it might because uh, my understanding is there are different areas within voiceover which do not come under um, the, uh, the control of, uh, of unions. So uh, I would first of all, again, check to make sure. I would, st I would study and research that to, to make sure that your understanding is correct. Then secondly, you've got to make a decision. I mean, if, it's, if, the, if the rules of the game are, wow, if I become union, uh, then I can't do all of this stuff that I think or, you know, that I want um, then you may have to make a decision. Well, I'm either going to go path A or path B. Um, again, I know what works best for me. And by the way, you know, I, at the end of the day, when it comes to voiceovers, I mean, I'm a mercenary. I do this because I get paid to do this. I mean, I love to do it. I want to do it. Uh, but b believe me, if tomorrow, if I, if I can see a path where I can increase my income as a union talent, then you better know that that's the path uh, that's the path I'm going to take, um, as long as it offers me the same security that I've created for myself. And when I say security, meaning most union talent that I know are dependent on a smaller pool of jobs. So when they get a job, it might be a really great job. But, you know, I talk to a lot of great talent who only work, you know, once, twice a year, if, if that often. I do a lot of work. Uh, if I lose 10 clients tomorrow, it's no big deal to me because I've got a lot of clients and I can easily replace those clients. But if I'm depending on my year being one or two or three jobs and I lose one of those clients, I'm in trouble at that point. So it's not just a matter of how much money I can make now, but it's, it's how can I assure that my income continues to grow into the future. So, Sean, again, I, it's not a simple yes or no question, and I hope that helps, but make sure you study and research to make sure that it's going to have the effect that you think it does. And if it does, then, you, then you've got to make the, you know, the hard decisions. All right. Ted asks, when I started out in the business, uh, did I take projects that required music or sound effects in addition to a read, or were they just simply reads? Um, Ted, that's a really good question. It's, it's interesting. My experience has been that clients have rarely ever asked me to do full production. Now, I can do, I mean, I've produced, I've uh, estimated at least 10,000 commercials in my life. I've written, voiced, and or produced over 10,000 commercials. So I can certainly do it. I've done it. I do it when I'm producing demos for my voiceover clients. Um, but when I'm doing voiceover work, I am rarely ever, and when I say rarely, I mean uh, maybe once or twice a year. And I have, you know, I have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten clients a day, jobs a day. Maybe once or twice a year, somebody will say, hey, can we put music to this? And I can. I mean, if they want it, I can. So it's not an issue of when I first started or what I'm doing now. But the issue is this, Ted, and that is that most clients will not be asking you to do that. Now, you can, but, but and I have friends that have created that as, as kind of another stream of income. They market themselves as more of like a production house or an agency um, where they may actually even place ads on local media, but they, but they uh, do full production. You know, we do all the music and we'll hire additional voice talent and blah, blah. And you can market yourself that way. For me, though, that's just more, that complicates my business model. And as I said earlier, I'm nothing if not simple. And um, 
And by, by the way, being simple and being a simpleton are two, are two totally separate things, but I keep it very, very simple. And I do dry voiceover. If somebody asks me to do full production for a fee, I will do that. But I don't advertise that and I don't push that. Uh, I, don't, I never suggest it to a client. So, Ted, it's really, it's a non-issue unless you want it to be. Next question, how do you know if the quality of your audio MP3s uh, is a good quality or not? I was told that my noise floor was too high. Well, Michelle, we're talking about two different issues. We're talking about uh, the quality of the MP3 and the noise floor. And noise floor is simply, it's that, uh, excuse me, when you sit in your studio and when you're not saying anything, when you're quiet, how much noise is in your studio. That's a separate issue from the quality of your MP3. That's the quality of your audio of the the signal that you're putting into your recording, into your MP3. And so if your noise floor is too high, you've got to find ways to isolate that noise away from you. And I don't know enough about your situation. It could be that maybe you have a computer close to you and it, the, the fan, the computer fan may be generating a noise. It could be the, uh, you know, the air system within your house, the heater, the air conditioning. It could be uh, environmental noise outside. And it may require, you know, anything from putting more acoustic material, finding a more isolated place in your home uh, and surrounding yourself with acoustic material to actually perhaps buying a recording booth of some sort, which is what I've done and I'm sitting in right now. And my noise floor is virtually non-existent. It's very, very quiet. Now, to your question about the quality of your MP3, um, I always ask my client, if it's a new client that I've never worked with and I don't know what their preferences are, I always ask them, Uh, What are your audio file requirements or do you have an audio file preference? Because they may want an MP3. They may want a WAV. They may want an AIF. They may want something else. Um, And if they do want an MP3, then, you know, you can determine the quality and the size of the file by how many uh, megabits uh, per second, yeah, megabytes per second are in that file. I generally record at 192. Some clients may want 128 or 256 or 320. And if that's, if what I'm saying doesn't make any sense to you, that's something to do a little research on, on um, file format specifications for MP3 files. Um, Most of my clients want theirs at 192, and that is of adequate quality, but not everybody. You know, some people want so some people want a higher quality. I've had someone who some who actually want a lower quality. Uh, Tim says or asks, what would be the next demo to do after you have a marketable commercial demo, and how long should you wait to have a different demo produced? Well, uh, your very most important demo is going to be your commercial demo, Tim, and I and I know you, and I know I know you know that. So, but that's for the benefit of everybody else. That's your flagship. If you do nothing else, you can. And I don't care what you specialize in. You should always have a commercial demo, uh, because that's that's what agents are going to listen to. That's what casting directors. That's what most clients are going to listen to. And your commercial demo will show your it will show your capabilities. Now. Uh, That being said, should you decide to do a second demo, and I recommend uh, a second demo, uh, which should be your narration demo. The reality is, even though most people will listen to your commercial demo, for most of us who do this as a living, and uh, and I don't care where at on the voiceover food chain you are, most of us who do this for a living, we record more narration than we do commercials. Not everybody, but most of us. Uh, I probably record... Gosh, I would say, you know, 60 to 70 percent of my workload is narration. I mean, that's my bread and butter. There's so much, you know, there's so much of it out there. And so a narration demo gives my clients something else to listen to. So they know I can do, they know I can do hard sell, soft sell, guy next door. But they want to hear me within the context of an e-learning narration, perhaps a documentary uh, perhaps a longer form corporate type of narration. So that would be the next demo. Now, in terms of how long you should wait, there's no rule on that. I mean, a lot of people that I work with and produce for, we do the commercial narration demo together uh, in the same session. Of course, I have a few training sessions with them ahead of time, but we record them both and then I produce them both at the same time. Other people choose to wait. Um, like I said, I, you, can, you can build a career around a commercial demo 
Uh, but I think a narration demo is is a great second demo to have. It really supports your efforts. I would I would do it sooner rather than later. Again, I don't think there's a magic number. But being that most of the work out there, if you look at the universe of voiceover work, the bulk of it's going to fall under the category of narration. And so having a narration demo is certainly going to help you um, in that area. Okay, let's see here. Have you ever heard of Linda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com? And if so, what are your thoughts? Yes, Eddie, I have. As a matter of fact, I've been a longtime subscriber to Linda dot com, L-Y-N-D-A. And again, I'm not being paid to say this. Uh, Linda is a subscription uh, website where they have really excellent training programs. I mean, and everything from, oh gosh, business and marketing to if you're a mus- musician and you want to learn how to you know, market yourself, you want to be a music producer, you want to learn how to use Adobe Audition or Pro Tools. Uh, they have some really outstanding um, training programs and you can, um, there are different levels of membership and you can pay. I think I was paying something like $36 a month for unlimited access to all of their programs. And I remember I went through the entire Adobe audition program and I have a lot of interest in a lot of different things. So I looked, I've looked at a lot of their programs, but I have a very high opinion of lynda.com. And I think it's a great place, uh, you know, to, to really dig into your recording program and learn more about it. Okay. Um, how do you recommend getting into e-learning? Okay. Let's talk about e-learning. I just talked about that right at the top of the hour, that it's one of the four big growth areas to, to look at as we move into, into the new year. It's been growing for a long time. We'll only continue to do so. When I market myself as a voiceover talent, Josiah, and I, and I hope you'll find this helpful, um, I don't market myself within a specific niche when it comes to commercial and narration. Now, um, I also do quite a bit of radio imaging, and I'm beginning to, to do more in the areas of promo. And that's really, it's a different discussion, but when it comes to commercial and narration, I don't differentiate in the way that I market myself. Most of my clients are video production companies. And these are companies that do everything. I mean, they produce commercials. They produce corporate videos. They produce um, content for uh, training content for companies, which is the e-learning that you're talking about. So when I market myself, what happens is that, um, you know, these companies will have any variety of work. And one day it may be a commercial. The next day it may be, you know, maybe a 10-page narration for Xerox, or I mean, it could be any number of things. So I've never really had a specific e-learning plan. Um, my plan has been to get in front of the people who hire voiceover talent. That has been, uh, again, I, like I told you, I'm pretty simple. I don't get overly sophisticated when it comes to this. And um, what that has done is that has opened up doors, all kinds of doors for me, but certainly e-learning. And within e-learning, I mean, everything from medical to technical, which I mentioned earlier, I do a boatload of, a lot of human resource. Uh, but this, most of this, and there are some, if you do some Google searches, you'll find a few companies that do specialize in it. But most of these come from, you know, video production houses all over the country, all around the world. As a matter of fact, while, I, while I'm mentioning all around the world, India is kind of the mecca of e-learning content development. And it's been that way for a number of years. Um, as a matter of fact, one of, my, one of my best clients right now is a, is an Indian based company. Um, and if you, again, just use Google, Google is your best friend when it comes to building your voiceover business. And you might want to, you could reach out to these companies specifically, generally speaking, uh, you're not going to get the same rates. In my case, I'm actually getting a really good rate. Uh, but my experience has generally been that you may not get a great rate, but Hey, when you're starting off, it's about generating income. It's not about getting top dollar. At least it shouldn't be. So, um, again, Josiah, that's been my approach, and I hope that's uh, helpful to you. Commercial versus narration demo. Oh, yeah, just address that. Commercial, absolutely. Got to have it. If you have a second, which would be nice, definitely look at narration. Are we just listening to you? There's no video. I did try to share my screen. I don't know if you see my screen right now or not. Oh, wait a minute. Um, Yeah, I think you are. 
And by the way, I haven't put anything new on the screen, so if you don't see it, you're not missing a lot. I do have, I do have this. Um, as I mentioned, I'm launching a brand new, it's a four-hour video program about uh, char- getting into the character voiceover business featuring um, Christina Melizia, who's awesome. VOCharactersuccess.com is the website, VOCharactersuccess.com. You use the coupon code 50OFF, 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 all caps, 50OFF. Uh, between now and midnight Christmas night, and you get 50 bucks off that program. Okay, Eric asks, if I'm recording an audiobook where the author references other works, what is the best way to verbally differentiate between the three different sources? Author's words, referenced words, reference itself. For example, it is a biblical book. The author of the book might write, and Jesus said, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. Okay, that's that's a really good question, and let me—it's a really good question for the publisher because, and I've done, uh, and I've done uh, several books with a lot of biblical references, and what you may find is that I don't know that there is one steadfast rule. I found I found that different publishers often ask for different things, so if there is an issue or a question, um, I would always go to the publisher because they typically will have uh, like a style guide that they can share with you or a manual, a policy procedure manual that will explain a lot of that so that when you come across these kind of things, you'll be able to address it in the way that the publisher uh, wants it to be done. But, you know, just one of the many things that you have to kind of navigate with uh, when it comes to it comes to audiobooks. Uh, I do not yet have a demo for e-learning documentary. Would you recommend I submit my commercial demo for a demo or a dry read with appropriate examples? Well, if you're... Okay, here's the thing. If somebody has approached you and said, hey, uh, we're interested in hiring hiring you to do e-learning uh, for us, um, what I would do, I would... Uh, if they actually have a script and they say, here's the script that we're, we're thinking about hiring you for, then I would definitely record a custom demo of that script. Give them a minute or two. 60 seconds is more than enough of that script. That would be your demo. That's essentially your audition. If it's a more general approach, like you're reaching out to a company um, and you don't yet have a narration demo or something that has samples of e-learning and you have a professionally produced commercial demo, I would use the professionally produced commercial demo because that's going to if it's done properly it's going to showcase you i've actually had some people excuse me who who were afraid they were afraid to hire me because i thought i was too good they thought that uh, you know they they couldn't afford me um and which in some cases maybe that's the case but often and the reason i say that is because my commercial demo is pretty polished i mean uh, the idea of a, of a commercial demo is it should sound like it was just pulled off the tv you know, national commercials just pulled off the TV. And so you want to create the, the, the impression that, you know, that you're a world-class talent because either you are or you're becoming one. And, um, you know, a good commercial demo will give the right impression. And the worst thing that could, I mean, you know, let, let your worst problem be, they say, well, I, I think maybe you're too good to work with us. And you say, you know, hey, I work with all kinds of companies, all different sizes, and let's talk. Let's have a conversation. That's not a bad place to start. Okay, wow. And again, thanks for your questions tonight. If you have them, feel free to put them in that the little question box there on your panel. And I'm, I'm going to get, to, again, to as many of these as I can. Um, you have talked about using national spots in your demo. If you are writing original copy, can you use real products? Yeah, I mean, uh, you may if you want to talk to an attorney about this, you can. Um, but I will tell you from my experience, and usually uh, fair use is the term that's thrown around a lot. As long as it's being used for a demo and you're not selling it, and only a very short portion of it is being used of an actual commercial or a brand name, um, then it falls under fair use. Again, I'm not an attorney. I'm also not an accountant, but I, you know, I can share my experiences with you. And the people that I know who do this, everybody uses national spots. Everybody who's successfully doing this that I know at, at the top levels of voiceover, um, and it's not because they necessarily were the ones who recorded them to begin with. It's because they're staging themselves properly. So, yes, yeah, feel free to do that. Although, by the way, if you're not a copywriter, I'd be re- I'd think hard, long and hard about writing your own copy. Hey, I am a copywriter. That's how I began my career. And I don't even write my own copy. You know, I just I use actual existing copy. Okay, and happy holidays. Well, thank you, Trevor. Happy holidays to you as well. I appreciate that. 
Okay, what website would you recommend for a novice VO artist to start on to break into the industry and bid on work? Okay, so the assumption here is that we're going to use a website to break into the industry, which is not a bad idea, by the way, Kermit. Um, th which brings us to the topic of pay-to-play. There are um, a small handful of, of websites out there where you pay a yearly fee, a membership. It could be 100 bucks, could be 400 bucks or more, where you're given access to auditions. Um, I, let me give you a couple of my favorites, and I say this because I, I book work and get really good good jobs through these websites. One is Voices.com. And by the way, I've worked out a deal with Voices.com that if uh, – if you when you if you sign up for Voices.com, you sign up for their uh, premium membership. If you enter my name, Bill Deweese, let me type this up here so you can see it. Bill Deweese, one word, B I L L D E W E E S. It'll knock fifty bucks off your fee. Um, so Voices.com, I'm a big fan. I I think these guys uh, have their act together. I think they're, uh, you know, they're big fans of voiceover talent. I think, you know, they, they get it, they care, they, you know, and they, they bend over backwards to work with voiceover talent. Uh, my other favorite is Voice123.com. Um, I have, in terms of pay to play, I have booked more work off of that than any other website and continue to book. I get work pretty much weekly from that website. Uh, I have many clients that I have today. I picked up back when I first started in voiceovers, like back in 2006 um, from Voice123. So those, those uh, again, I have a, a really strong affinity because I've been using them and I've booked some really great work and I have some really great clients through those websites. I'm not saying they're the only good ones out there. Uh, I've messed around with some others. Uh, again, those, in my humble opinion, uh, that's if I was starting today, you know, to, to your question, that's, that's what, where I would start. How do you choose the correct pronunciation of several digit numbers, for example, 127, 2,345, 100, and, or just 127? Well, um, that's a good question. And when you're doing narration, this kind of stuff comes up a lot. Now, uh, many of my clients have given me specific directions on how they would like numbers to be given. But I can't, like, there are some hard, or there are some rules, generally used rules. I don't know who made up these rules, that as you do this long enough, you begin to figure these out. So, and by the way, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know how I learned all this stuff? I did. I, I, I made mistakes. I goofed it up, you know, and I've been corrected uh, more times than I would care to admit. And so I've learned because I haven't been afraid to, to uh, bash my head up against a lot of brick walls along the way. But let's say it's a, it's a car dealership. When you're doing a car dealership uh, and it's a four digit price, it's almost always broken down into two numbers. So let's say the price is $6,789. The price would be $6,789. That is a rule. Again, I don't know who made it up, but it's almost always that way. Um, when you're giving, uh, let's say, an address and it's a four digit, usually it's the same, you know, it's the same kind of thing. There are times that even today, you know, I'll be doing a script and frankly, I don't know. I don't know what they want. Uh, but if it's if I'm, let's say, reading a training narration and the number is 127, I'll usually I'll leave out the word and and I'll say 127. Or 345, because adding the word and just complicates it. And as if you've learned nothing else tonight about me, you've learned them very simple. Keep it very simple. So 125. Um, with phone numbers, you know, um, I personally, my preference is to, is to break down the last four digits of a phone number into two numbers. So instead of uh, 5555, five, 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 it'd be 5555. Five. But... Not every client wants that. So don't be afraid to either A, ask, or B, just do what sounds right to you and be prepared for the client to come back and say, you know, worst case scenario, they say, eh, you know what, I, please, why don't you do these as single digits? No big deal. And then you correct it and you send it back. Don't be afraid to, you know, to try things. Next question is this from Connor with regards to prospective clients asking for a rate card after my initial email marketing. How do you respond? Thanks, Bill. Connor, that is a great question. It's the old rate card question, and it can be a bit intimidating as a voice talent. I'll be honest with you. I don't like, you know, even now, I've done this for a long time, and I don't like to be asked for my rate card um, because here's the reason. I don't know where that client is at, 
And if you've done this for any length of time, you know rates are all over the place. You know what one client's willing to pay 100 bucks for, another client's willing to pay $1,000 for. And um, the very, there are many variables involved. And I'm not saying that uh, all clients should pay the same price. I think, that, again, there are a number of variables uh, involved. And I, I don't want to throw a rate card out there and either immediately scare them with sticker shock or underprice myself and not be able to get the most I can out of the job. So uh, here's what I like to do. And then I will come back to the rate card. I, I do have an answer specifically for that. But before I, before I get to the rate card, what I try to do is have a conversation about the specific project. If they have a specific project, and if not, you know, what you can say is, you know, I tried, and here's, here's my response. Um, I understand that every project and every client are different and that budgets vary widely from client to client because, uh, and by the way, this is me talking to you now, not me talking to the client. Understand that your client, the production house, is working with their client. So in other words, you're really working for, you know, two kind of two generations away um, in, in, in the production house is, is the middle person. So you're dealing with the budget of typically the end client, not the production house. So you're recognizing that you're dealing, you know, they may have a small mom and pop one week. Next week, they may be working with a Fortune 500. So I understand that, uh, that, that the budgets of clients can vary greatly. And therefore, I try to be as flexible as I can to fit with the budget of the client. That's my stock answer. I try to be as flexible as I can. Because uh, what I want to do, I want them to show me their hand. And if they come to me with a specific project, my first question is, what have you budgeted for voiceover for this project? And if it's something that I think sounds reasonable, then I can say, that sounds about right. That's great. We can do that. Or if I feel that, it, that it's especially low, I can say, well, you know, I typically would get X number of dollars for this. Is that within the budget? And if not, then that begins, that's a place to begin a conversation negotiating. And when I say negotiating, I'm not talking about hard sell back and forth in each other's face. I'm just saying, okay, you know, here's where, I, this is what I usually get. Okay. Let's say I usually get 300 bucks. Uh, you're, you're saying you've got a hundred bucks. Okay. I tell you what, if we can meet someplace in the middle, if, you can, if we can do 175, but you give me, give me three days to get it done. I always try to get something in exchange. I can do that. Um, and again, that, that's a hypothetical, but I often use time as a negotiating tool, because what happens is, is that most clients want their project, want your recording back when? Yesterday. You know, rarely does somebody come and say, hey, can, uh, can you get that back to me next week? It's always like, hey, how quick can you get this to me? So by asking them for something in return, it makes them feel like there's a give and take. Plus, it gives me a little more time frame and I can do it more at my leisure or when I have, not that there's a whole lot of leisure around here, but I can do it at a time that works best for me. So, um, okay, that aside, I do have a rate sheet, <laughs> okay, to get to your original question. I try not to send it, Connor, but when I have to, I do. And uh, if it seems like the only option, um, and I've, I've put together a rate sheet just based on, you know, this, uh, the websites like Voices.com and, you know, a lot of the people have rate sheets out there. Look around, nose around, and just see what people are getting and come up with something that, that feels comfortable to you. And that as time goes by and you begin to work with clients, you'll become more confident in what you can get for your work. And the longer you do this, the better you get, the more established you become, the more you can get for what you do. All right, next question. What should I budget for starting out for having a, a pro produce a narration and commercial demo? And is it feasible to record from home for regular recording from there? I'm struggling with how to set up a good home studio and a shed in the back of my home. Okay, so there's really two questions here. One is the setting up of your studio. The one is, uh, is producing uh, your demos. And, you know, you're going to get different quotes from, from different people. And what I'm going I'm to tell you what I charge for demos. And um, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not the cheapest, and I'm by no means the, the, the most expensive. Uh, but what I charge for a demo, and typically I would encourage you to start with a commercial demo, is $1,650. And that includes, that's two training sessions as well. That's the copy selection. Your scripts are selected for you. I'll coach you through those. Um, the recording session, all the production, post-production and mastering. Um, and then when somebody wants to do a second demo together, like say, okay, I want to do my commercial and my narration together uh, in the same session, and we co we coach those together. What I do is I knock off half of the second one, so it'd be sixteen fifty for the first one, and then half of that. What what's that eight twenty five? I think for the second one. 
Um, again, that's just to give you a point of reference, and you certainly do your due diligence and do your homework and find out. Uh, but just as important as what people are charging, it's not, and, and I know you know this from, you know, anything that you go out and buy, certainly price is a factor, but make sure that what you're getting is going to accomplish what you want it to, because it doesn't matter how much you pay if you don't get anything in return. In other words, will that, will that, will that demo accomplish its intended purpose of staging you? When an agent listens to that, when a casting director listens to that, when a client listens to that, will they have a favorable impression of you? And will it make them persuade them to throw an audition your direction? That's the purpose of a demo. So if you save a thousand bucks on a demo, but it gets, brings you nothing in return, you just lost money. But you could spend, you know, maybe many thousands of dollars on a demo and the return could way more than justify that. And again, I know you know that, but sometimes... When you're starting up, the dollars, and again, believe me, I've been there. I totally understand. You're looking for ways to cut costs, not to, to, to spend more, but your demo is, is incredibly important. Um, and I think this t- ties into what you're asking about your studio. Um, if you have a good home studio, you should be able to, like, to do your session, your demo session from home. For instance, I would say about 80% of my demo clients, we actually do, we do all the training over Skype, and I and I direct the recording session over Skype, um, and I do I ask for test audio. I want to hear what they have. I want to make sure, because I want to make sure their product is great. My goal is to create a killer demo. So unless you're you're you, you know you're really producing a high quality audio, you shouldn't do it from home. But you should get into a professional studio and maybe travel. For instance, a number of people travel into my studio here in the Chicago area, which I love because I love to meet you face to face, and and I can control the you know I know what I'm getting. Out of, out of my studio. So um, you want to make sure that before you, you know, record your demo, uh, before you begin auditioning, that you're producing a good audio product, you know, the quality of the audio, and which means that, you know, quote unquote noise floor needs to be really low. It needs to be really quiet. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to have compression and a whole bunch of EQ. It can just be, you know, a good microphone into a good inf- interface into your computer, but it better be quiet and acoustically well treated. And then you've got, you know, then you've got something to, to work with. For musical beds and sound effects, do you recommend buying a library or using a subscription service? Well, it really, the answer to that, Joe, is how much, you know, are you going to use it? Um, if it's only on occasion, you might want to just do a, um, a subscription service where you're just paying, like, or I'm sorry, do it where you're actually buying a song because you can purchase this individual tracks for your productions. I do so much production. I do a lot of demo production, so um, a lot. And I use uh, a subscription service where I have access to thousands and thousands and thousands of songs and sound effects and, and because I need a virtually a limitless supply. So for me, a subscription makes sense. I pay an annual fee for that. So again, depending on how much you use, you may want to, if you're just doing a few here and there, I would just buy them outright. Otherwise, I would go to a subscription. Uh, when you do audiobooks, do you do the whole production process? Yes. Short answer to that is yes, I do. I do the editing. Um, I do very little, unless... Uh, if I'm working with Audible, Audible has a whole list of, of requirements and when it comes to your EQ and compression and all that stuff. So um, if you're working for Audible specifically, you want to get their list of guidelines. And they have, um, they have some videos and stuff online to help you with that as well. But with most of the work that I've done uh, outside of Audible, anyhow... Uh, I just use my my basic sound chain. I don't do I don't touch anything. I just do it the way I do it every day, and then I edit it and clean it up and send it out. But most clients will want you to do your own editing. Okay, Yvonne, pay to play. I only had one job in my first year on Voice One Two Three, shortlisted on a number of projects. I consider that progress. Not enough money to pay for the subscription, but I value continued access to constant flow of auditions. Thoughts? Well. Um, it's not enough. I mean, if you're not getting your money back because it costs maybe just about 400 bucks to do that for a year. Um, I guess my next question would be, how many times did you audition? I really don't know enough from this to, to be able to really make a good, I guess, recommendation. Uh, I, I will tell you this, Yvonne, when I first started off, uh, it took me 100 or so auditions to get my first job. So, you know, if you did 50 auditions and you only landed one job... 
you know, uh, then maybe that's, you know, it's, t- it's you got to figure out what you're doing. And it takes a little while to figure out what you're doing. Now I book pretty frequently. It's a completely different ballgame now. I understand how to audition. I'm way better at it now than I was, you know, nine years ago. And uh, I book frequently. And um, so it's a very good investment, uh, you know, for me. Uh, I would, there are some things, and we could have a very long discussion on how to get the most out of that experience uh, at some point in the near future. And you can, by the way, if you're interested, I want to create things that are helpful to you. Uh, the reason I do this is because I want to create programs, products, training that is relevant and will help you accomplish what you want to do. And something I've been thinking about a lot is creating a program that takes an in-depth look at pay-to-play and how to make sure you get the most out of that experience because I believe it has more potential, especially for the beginning voice talent, than just about anything else outside of audiobooks, which is even easier if you have access to ACX. Um, If that's something that would be of interest knowing the particular strategies involved, because there are strategies, there's an understanding of what happens behind the curtain, so you know how to get the most out of it, um, drop me an email and let me know at voiceoverexpert at gmail.com. Let me type this up on the screen. Or if you have anything else you're interested, uh, you think would be a good program for me to put together, voice, just let me know. Because, again, I want to create things uh, that would be most helpful and meaningful to you. Okay, what is the difference between ebooks and audiobooks? Are they considered the same thing? By the way, happy holidays and happy holidays to you. Um, Marcia or Marcia, forgive me, I've covered all the bases there, hopefully. Um, no, they're not the same thing. An ebook is, uh, is a digital book that is usually text. When somebody talks about ebooks, it's usually a text, like something you would download to your Kindle or your iPad, or maybe you'd read on, on, you'd read on your computer, but it would be a text. An audiobook is just that. It's an audio form. So if somebody says ebook, they're probably, probably talking about a text-based digital book, although you might want to ask just to make sure. Uh, but otherwise, you know, audio obviously is, is, is something you're listening to as opposed to reading. With all the work you do, how do you take care of your voice, especially during this time of year, cold and flu season? Oh, Cecil, that's a good question. Um, I tell you, I feel very, I feel fortunate. I feel blessed. Um, I stay healthy. I really don't go to any great extremes to do so. Uh, I wish I could give you a long list of uh, things that I do to maintain. Uh, I mean, I do try to stay healthy. I've, I've always enjoyed running. And I've run, I've run the Chicago Marathon a couple of times. And as I've gotten older, I haven't run as much. But my daughter and I started running again this past summer uh, in preparation to, to run a marathon sometime in the near future. So I do like to run. I think that helps keep me healthy, generally speaking. But in, in and of itself, I don't think it's enough. I do take a multivitamin in the morning. Um, I take some uh, also nutritional supplements as well. Again, I'm not the kind of guy that takes like 50 pills. I don't do that. Just a couple of things that I, that I take, you know, again, a multivitamin and some nutritional supplements. And um, that is really the big thing. I mean, those are the, uh, when I feel a cold coming on and, you know, it happens every season I get a sinus infection. I mean, it happens. But when I feel that first cold coming on, I take um, a pro- over-the-counter product called Cold Ease uh, and by the way, you can get in this. You can get this in generic form too at Walgreens or Walmart. But the brand, the name brand, is Cold Ease. I believe that's how they spell it. Cold Dash E Z E. And it's been proven to shorten the duration of a cold. If you start taking at the first sign of a cold, you start taking these, and it's just like it's a mouth lozenge. Like every four to six hours, you 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 take one, and um, it really does. I mean, I've noticed a huge difference. It really cuts the duration. It can nip it in the butt if you get it early enough. So that's something to to you know to keep in mind. The other thing is have access to a doctor so that when you when the, if you get a sinus infection, that will knock you out of you know out of play for doing voiceovers. So um, you know have a good relationship with a doctor so your doctor can maybe call you in a, a prescription a Z-pack or some sort of antibiotic to take care of that as quickly as possible. But those are the main things uh, that I do in regards to staying, staying healthy. Okay, another audiobook question and uh, boy the questions keep pouring in here and uh, uh, let me answer a few more of these again. I want to I want to spend as much time as I can. Although there are a lot of um, there are a lot of Christmas preparations going on at the Dewey's household. I've got I've got three grown kids, one of which still lives here at home, and one of which travels in um, she'll, uh, to work with me every day. Mallory, 
my assistant, my full-time assistant's also my daughter, and she lives here in town. But I have three grown kids and two grandsons. And so everybody, plus I've got my, my mother-in-law and my, my brother-in-law are traveling in tomorrow. So it's going to be a big day here at the Deweese uh, house tomorrow and leading into Christmas. So lots of preparations. But that being said, let, let's get to a few more questions before I run. ACX audiobook question. I received the automated, you didn't get the gig email from ACX, but the book is still listed. What do you think of sending a message to the rights holder asking if there was anything specific that they didn't like, or do they have any suggestions for a future audiobook? Um, here's my take on this. My, when it comes to any audition, I've developed the mentality of set it and forget it. In other words, I do an audition, it goes out the door. I literally don't give it another thought. It wasn't always that way. It took a while. Uh, but for one thing, I do, you know, I do a lot of auditions. You have to do a lot of auditions if you want to do, record voiceovers full time. So you can't, you can't, you don't have the emotional bandwidth, the, the emotional capacity to hold on to everything like that and wonder what's going to happen and worry about it. So, uh, so from that standpoint, I would recommend in any audition, regardless of what it's for, you just do it and then you forget about it. Don't even think about it. If you get the job, they'll let you know. If you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, but if you, you really feel compelled that you want to find out what, the, what they thought, personally, I wouldn't. I would never go back to a client and, and ask him what they thought of the audition. Uh, because here, here's the thing. It can make you sound desperate. And they may have really liked your audition. They may perceive you to be a world-class talent and not somebody who's just getting started. Somebody, And they may perceive you to be somebody who would not feel insecure. And if you begin asking them questions like that, it positions you as, as being insecure. And, and, and aren't we all to a certain degree? But we don't want to appear that way to our clients. So, again, my recommendation is I wouldn't because they may have you on a short list for another book coming up. And if, if you go back and begin asking questions, they may think, oh, well, maybe he's not as good as we thought he was. You just don't, you don't want to cast that kind of cloud uh, over their thinking towards you. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. My voice is terrible. How can I make my voice sound better? Oh, <laughs> gives the reference of Howard Stern in Private Parts, the movie, which is a, is, it's a classic. Um, well, first of all, you know, is your voice terrible? I don't know. Um, I've met very few people who who love their voice. And most people that I've known who did love their voice probably shouldn't have loved it as much as they did, if you understand where I'm coming from. Um, most people can give you a long laundry list of things they would would like to have that they don't, me included. I mean, there's, there's all things we, you know, we always want what we don't have, right? The grass is always greener. So my first thing would be to say that your voice may, may very well not be terrible. Um, if there if if there's a physical issue, it might require some speech therapy. But let me also say this: that the sound of someone's voice is far overrated. People are not compelled, generally speaking, by the sound of your voice. In other words, having a good sounding voice, whatever that means, they're compelled because you speak with authenticity, with conviction, and with emotion. By the way, that's an acronym: A C E ACE. Authenticity, conviction, and emotion. And when you communicate with those three elements, people are compelled to pay attention to what you have to say. And as voiceover talent, that's what we're all looking for. We want to be compelling. We want the person who's listening to our audition to all of a sudden kind of wake up from their nap, you know, as they listen through 100 auditions and say, whoa, who was that? Because it was compelling. They had to pay attention to what you had to say. All right, next question. I'm a beginner and considering attending uh, your February Los Angeles voiceover offering. Will I be in over my head? No, you will not. And uh, Dennis, I'm glad you brought this up because I hadn't mentioned it. And that is I have uh, my voiceover revolution. It's a two-day workshop is coming up in February, February 7th and 8th in Los Angeles. And I'm going to put the website up here in case you want to find out more. And I'm not going to go into a long speech on it. Voiceover Revolution Events.com. That's, that's where you go. This is a workshop. And most of the, in one of these workshops um, that I've done, I've got a broad range of people. People are just thinking about getting into it to, to people who are, who are doing it, you know, on a full-time basis. Um, but we're going to cover a broad range of material, everything from, um, you know, how you how to give a great performance with the script that you're given, which will be very applicable 
to, to, to uh, beginners. Uh, I'm going to talk about a marketing plan. And I don't care whether you're just starting in this or you've done it for 10 years. Everybody needs more marketing help. Everybody wants to be a better business person. Everybody wants to get more clients. You know, and to be better at that, um, Dave Corvassier, um, who is a uh, very well-known voiceover talent. He's also the uh, Las Vegas CBS evening uh, news anchor. And uh, he's going to be talking about social networking. He's an expert in that area, how to use social networking to build your voiceover career. Christina Malizia, who I just recently did the voiceover character success workshop with, uh, who has done, I I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of character voices. Uh, She'll be doing a workshop there as well. It's going to be awesome. And I can't, and I hope you come, Dennis. I I look forward to, to meeting you. And the next question is, would you estimate the total cost for a total beginner? including coaching, demo, and to include enough engineering schooling to start producing my product. Um, yeah, I, I, you don't need to go to engineering school to do this. Um, I'm not saying you might not need some engineering coaching or at least to, you know, perhaps check out a program or two on uh, lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A, to start. Um, but, I mean, I would budget, you know, knowing what I know now, uh, I essentially jumped into this without any budget and just kind of, you know, use my credit card (laughs) to get what I needed to get. But depending on what you need for a studio, for instance, do you need a full-blown whisper room or vocal booth recording studio, which is going to cost you between three and four thousand dollars brand new? Um, If you need one of those, well, then, you know, that's a big cost to begin with. But that aside, let's say you could do what I did and I operated out of a bedroom closet for several years. Um, A couple of, you know, I would look at maybe twenty five hundred, three thousand bucks to get some basic equipment to get to get uh you know your first demo and some basic coaching um you know in that general area uh you know as many of you know my my first my first studio i had $300 in total into the equipment in that and that was doing it on the cheap i mean i was flying by the seat of my pants but i got the most out of that i i tell you i got the absolute most out of that but you know i would want to budget you know, closer to a thousand bucks or more for my studio budget, $1,500 to $2,000 for my demo. And that's where, you know, the bulk of that cost is going to, to come from. Okay. Would I recommend marketing in and around the local city of a quarter million or putting myself out on sites like voices.com or other online web marketing? Hey, I, I recommend doing it all. Um, yeah, I mean, at least that's, that's the way I approach this. I did everything that you mentioned. I did all of that and more. Uh, but if you're looking to get started more incrementally, and again, I don't know what your time frame is, um, you know, maybe you want to jump into this full time right away. Maybe you're working full time and you want to kind of work your way into it. Um, I really do believe that one of the best ways to get started is in audiobooks uh, and using ACX.com if you can, if, if you don't live in Canada. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, a site like Voices.com or Voice123.com can be really a good place to begin. Um, but you have to understand that there's a learning curve and you may audition a hundred or 200 times with no success, but that's just the way it is. That's the way it is for almost all of us. I know it was, it was that way for me, but with the proper coaching and direction, you'll get it. You'll learn to audition. Well, you'll learn how to use the system to your advantage. Um, and then, but I think that's probably the simplest way, uh, because the auditions come into your inbox every day. Is there a version of Adobe Audition that you do not have to subscribe to? Yeah, well, there's, you know, the most recent uh, iteration of Adobe Audition is the cloud version. So you pay 20 bucks a month, which is great for the first year. But if you use it for five years, you've paid like over a thousand bucks for it, uh, which I'm not a big fan of either. Um, but the, here's the thing. They don't sell the older versions of it unless you can find it from an individual. Adobe, you know, once they upgrade, they don't sell the old version. So unless you can find an individual, you're kind of kind of stuck with it. Uh, what is a mic comparable in price and quality uh, to the VO1A? Is the, uh, okay, uh, you're asking about a specific microphone, the VO1A. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of people who use it and are happy with it. I've never used it myself. Um, but I'm, I, from what I've heard, I mean, from the audio I've heard, it sounds to be like a very good microphone. Um, and so you're talking about a microphone that's like more in the $300 range, I believe, uh, give or take. Um, you might want to look in the area of MXL, Marshall MXL microphones. You'll find some good mics in that range. And I've uh, my first mic was a, was a Marshall MXL. Uh, also, Blue makes a great line of mics. Blue, B-L-U-E-M-I-C. 
bluemike.com, bluemike.com. And they have um, my particular favorite is the is the uh, Bluebird mic for the price. I think it's it's a really nice microphone. Okay, let's see here. Let's uh, let's quickly go through maybe a few more. Uh, okay, what happens when you get a 90-second explainer, but the script is over two minutes? <laughs> oh, been there, Nancy. Uh, you complete the job at over two minutes. They say, great, we will get back with a new draft. They seem to think the voiceover allows them drafts. Well, here's the thing that you'll learn you, after you've done this long enough. And sometimes even, you know, I still make mistakes and, and I'll do things. Things like this will happen and I'll think, Bill, why did you not establish the boundaries of this relationship up front? It still happens to me on occasion. Um, the key is establishing everything up front. When they say 90 seconds uh, and you quote for that, you know, a couple of things you want to keep in mind. Number one, you want to check to make sure the script is actually give or take 90 seconds. You also want to, if you want to charge for pickups, meaning, you know, you go back and, and do um, uh, edits that they make later, um, you want, to, you want to, to establish that up front. So, for instance, when I, let's say somebody comes to me with a 90 second explainer video, I quote them my rate and I will say that includes one round of minor pickups. Meaning, or minor, minor revisions is the way I put it, of minor revisions. Meaning that, okay, the client comes back and says, I need to change a word or two. Okay? I'll do that one time and I won't charge you anything. After that, I'm going to, I'm going to charge them. You know? And I don't even talk about that up front because most people, they don't, unless they ask you, I don't even talk about that. I just charge them when the time comes. But if the script came to me and it was two minutes long, what I would do is I would I contact the client and I'd be very polite and say, um, you know, I don't know if you realize this, the script is 450 words long, which would make it way more than 90 seconds long. Uh, for me, 155 to 160 words a minute is about about how, how I read. So that's a good way for me to judge the length of, of a script. And then uh, at that point, uh, I would give them a chance to either give me a new script or we would negotiate a new price. So just establish that stuff up front and don't be afraid to address them. Okay, when you produce narration, do you add compression? And do you produce all of your demos in stereo? I produce all of, my, all of the demos that I do for clients in stereo. I, I produce all of my voiceovers, auditions and voiceovers in mono. The reason being, demos are full productions with music and sound effects. Stereo is appropriate and best. For voiceover, where it's just your voice, mono is appropriate and best. And do I add compression to my narration? Um, when you say narration demo, I'm going to assume that you mean auditions or jobs. And, I, and, I, and Please forgive me if I have that wrong. Uh, but I do. Uh, I use an Aphex 230 vocal processor that I have just a wee bit of, I mean, a wee bit of compression, a wee bit of EQ. And so everything that I record, I record in real time, slightly compressed, slightly EQ'd for my voice in my studio. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Do you think accepting the production um, of erotic audiobooks via ACX would, would hinder a VO talent in the future from getting more serious jobs? No, and I think what you meant to say there was, uh, do you think um, denying producing erotic audiobooks would create a problem for you? No. No, because, you know, um, remember, you're not auditioning for ACX. You're auditioning for the publisher. So when you say no, and by the way, you know, I get asked all the time, so, you know, do you ever, ever have any moral quandaries when it comes to the work that you do? I really don't because, uh, well, wait a minute, let me, let me rephrase that. Yeah, there are things that come up that morally I'm just not going to do. But I have no qualms with saying, you know what, no, nah, you know, I don't do strip joint commercials. I don't do erotic audio books. And, you know, and, the, and if, they don't, if they don't ever hire me again, I, honestly, I don't give it a second thought. I, it's no big deal to me. Um, but the publisher of that material, they may not consider you again. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but obviously you don't want to do their work anyhow. So I don't, you know, I think it's an odd issue. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Don't do what you don't feel good about doing. Oh, and, um, Jonathan, thank you. You have a great holiday as well. Okay. Let's see here. I'm just going to kind of cherry pick here and, and wrap things up because it is getting late. And again, I so appreciate you being on this call. Um, editing out breaths. Do you completely edit out the breath or just a certain percentage of the breath? 50, 25% or what's the rule of thumb? Okay. Editing breaths. Let's you know, you're reading a script and between, between sentences you breathe in and you can see it on your little, uh, on your recording, uh, program. You can see the breath in there. 
here's my rule of thumb. When I do commercials, there are no breaths. I take out all breaths in commercials because when you do commercials, you're doing, let's say you're doing 15 seconds, 30 seconds, er, timing is extremely important. And so uh, what I, I use room tone. Room tone is the silence of your room when you're not speaking. Uh, and I, I record a little bit of room tone and I'll grab a little bit, I'll copy, I'll, I'll copy a little bit of that to my, my clipboard and I'll paste that over the breath. So I might take a half second between sentences where I, where I breathe and I'll paste over that with room tone, which is silent, but no, it's not, it's not muted silence. It's just the sound of your room. So it doesn't draw attention to itself. And maybe I'll paste over a half second with maybe two tenths of a second of room tone. So it shortens it. It allows me to put a little, you know, I can, if it's 31 or 32 seconds in length, I can get it down to 30 seconds and I've taken out the breaths. For long form narration, like training narration, no, I don't edit out breaths because that's supposed to sound more like me sitting down having a conversation with an employee. So typically rule of thumb, commercials, I edit out breaths, narration, generally speaking, I don't. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody was correcting me. In, in Canada, ACTRA is the union, not AFTRA. It's their equivalent to AFTRA. Okay, got it. Oh, by the way, your Black Friday package is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, Sheila, thank you. Um, if, if you don't know what that means, uh, I had a big Black Friday sale where we sold, I don't know how much, I mean, it was like, the value of it was like fifteen, sixteen hundred bucks for like three hundred dollars, and it is is I don't know maybe twenty hours, you know, thirty. It was over thirty hours of, of training content, um, and so I've had so many you know nice replies and feedback and follow. Thank you. Use it, Sheila. That's the thing. Just use it. Don't feel like you have to absorb all of it now, but maybe you know set a pace over the next year. Um, you know, like maybe every month look at a new module or a new training program and just begin to, to absorb it that way. Uh, as a matter, I tell you what I'm going to do for you guys who are still on with me tonight is another, an, a way to say Merry Christmas. I'm going to open that up. That website, if you want, if you want to go there, I'll leave it open. Um, it's a uh, VO black Friday sale.com VO black Friday sale.com. Go there, check it. I'll open it up so you can get in there and check it out. There's a t- a ton of stuff on that, um, but um, maybe it's it would be a great way to start your new year. You know, if if you don't have that at this point. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I'm getting a lot of Merry Christmases, Happy New Year, and Happy Holidays. Thank you. And there are so many questions here, I just cannot get to tonight. But I hope that we I've covered a lot of, a lot of things that will hopefully make your journey a little bit easier uh, in the upcoming year. Um, let me let me leave you with a closing thought, and I think this is really important. I was asked earlier um, this week by somebody, um, you know, they, they've been an entrepreneur for the past couple of decades and they know what it means to build a business and they're, they're just not sure they have the energy. They understand what it means to build a business and their biggest fear was that they just didn't have what it would take to do it again, yet again. And uh, what, could I, what would I say to them in that particular circumstance? Focus on the process. Focus on the process. And, you know, we all have goals. I'm as much a, a, of a goal-driven person as the next person. And, I, I, you know, I always have specific things I want to achieve, but I never tie myself too closely to specific dollars, amounts, and time frames because becoming a voiceover talent, a successful voiceover talent, is as much of a process as it is anything else. And it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to put a time frame on that. I feel very fortunate, very blessed that within the first year of me doing this, I was able to create uh, a six-figure income. Um, by the end of my 12th month, I was making consistently over $2,000 a week, and it just continued to grow from there. Some people do it faster than that. Some, for some people, it's much slower, and there are a number of variables that come into play. But the one that when I first started this, I didn't get too tied to the amount of money and time frame. What I did get what I did tie myself to was the process. I sat down and I decided, well, if I want to be successful at this, I need to do A, B, C, and D. I know I need to do these. These are the things I need to do. So every day I'm going to do those things. And I don't know what that's going to mean financially at the end of this week, this month, this year. I don't know. But I know that if I, if I follow the process, if I do the right things, that eventually I cannot help but see success. It takes a big load off. Because if you set a goal that says, well, I'm going to make X, I'm going to make $100,000 in 2015. Well, I hope you do. But what if you don't? Does that mean you're a failure? No. It just might mean that your process is going to take a little bit longer. But 
continue the process, refine your product, meaning your, you know, your delivery, the way you read, um, your demos, your website, uh, continue to work on the marketing side of the equation, become better at what you do, you know, evolve as a voice talent, become married to the process, not the end result. It will save you a lot of frustration and you will enjoy the journey and you will enjoy the success that you do see, however quickly or however slowly it may come. And, um, and again, if I had to leave, that, those are the words that I leave you with as we wrap up this year and move into the next. And I look forward to, to doing more of these kind of things with you in the near future. And again, drop me an email with your ideas for, for future webinars or training programs. And, um, you know, as you know, I do this full, I record full time. So the training part, you know, I'll do the best I can. That's, I, I will say that. And I do encourage you to take advantage of the VOCharactersuccess.com program with Christina Malizzi. I remember that 50 off coupon code is good through Christmas night. Well, God bless each and every one of you. I wish you a very, the happiest of holidays, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you're celebrating. I, I hope it's a wonderful time with, with family, with, with friends, and I look forward to hearing more about your success in the days to come, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Good night.